All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so if you're joining us, uh, we have pivoted. That's our word for like uh, the last year. I started using it before all this virus happened, and I didn't realize how prophetic that word was going to be in this season of constant change and constant rethinking. And, and so we're pivoting today. Um, there's a lot going on in our culture um, on the racial division and just the um, – the chaos in our world and the brokenness in our world. And so um, I just, I think it's good to have a conversation. You'll be having this conversation. I think you guys are on um, tomorrow as well at 10 with Chuck and Rich. And so, and I think this is important enough to spend a couple hours on probably longer than that, actually, where we really dive into um, really, how do we handle this as a, as a church? As we're called to be peacemakers, um, you know, I see a lot of posting, uh, at least this is my context, all right? I see a lot of posting on what people think and little posting on what we should be doing to um, create change and to work to um, create peace in, in, our, in our world and in our culture. And so um, just a few things before I pray um, for those that are attending or, um, you know, obviously you can do the Q&A. And what I think we want to do is... Uh, uh, I think Antoine and Victor are good with any question. I don't think they're going to be offended very easily. And if they are, they'll get over fairly quickly. And so um, I think in, sometimes in conversations like this, we need to be as honest and as um, – and some, que like some questions we don't ask because we're afraid to ask and offend somebody. And I'm hoping that we can have some conversations over the next few um, days and weeks where we can just ask the questions that we're afraid to ask and that we can answer them honestly. And I think the, the key phrase that we – all come into this with is humility. Like um, we need Jesus in this and um, in this time of the virus and in this time of racial tension, uh, we need more of him. So the, the humility and just be able to have a conversation and listen um, is kind of where I'm coming from. And uh, so honest uh, is a big part of that and a lot of questions. And so this uh, is um, just hopefully something we can um, grow together in. So I'm going to pray. And then just ask a few questions, and um, I think things will go from there where they go. Guys, come before you. Um, just looking to you. Uh, there's a lot of brokenness in our world, a lot of hurt, um, a lot of uh, people struggling with various things. And I just, I just pray that as you have put us here for this season, uh, for such a time as this, that you give us clarity on um, how we um, – lead in the midst of this um, to bring you glory, to bring oneness um, in the church and to bring um, the gospel, the good news of, of life change to those um, who need it. And I just pray that you uh, just work through this conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I'll just, I'm just going to ask you some questions really. As you're walking through this time, what are you processing as a leader, as a pastor, um, with what's going on in our culture right now? And you, either of you can answer that to start with. Like, how do you, what are you wrestling with in the midst of this? Antoine? Do I need to unmute you? Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm wrestling with a lot. And um, I'm in a very interesting place as it relates to uh, navigating my own humanity versus uh, the hope the promise of the cross. And so um, these last few weeks, I think actually these last few months has been very difficult in terms of uh, pastoring through pandemics. So you come out, you know, we're not fully out, but you see the other side of the pandemic. And then you see this, you start, it starts off with Ahmad, Ahmaud Arbery, and then, you know, you're processing that. And then you have this, um, George Floyd. So you're processing that. And then you have uh, the protest, and then you have um, the looting, the rioting. And so as a as African-American pastor, you, you, you are navigating through your own humanity, your own tensions, and then you're raising sons you know, so you're, so it's, a, it's a host of emotions that flood. Now I understand that we are not to be um, led by emotions, but emotions are indicators or where you are. So 
you have to go through that. And then you have, in my context, you have um, white brothers who blue collar rule America. Um, some, you know, literally have the Confederate flag. And then you have the young millennials um, who are African-Americans, college educated, professional. And then, so you, you, you have this, you have this tension that everybody's living in. So we've lived in the tension before the incident happened. And now it, 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 it happens. And, and so now you have to speak through shared experiences of the cross. But, you know, when an African-American Christian leaves the sanctity of the church, um, he's not seen, I'm not seen as a, as a pastor. I'm not seen as a husband, father, um, community involvement that I do. I may be seen as an African American and whatever that, you know, sparks from. So it's a difficult time. And so I have to rest in Christ, but also not numb myself to the present realities. Um, nobody likes being uncomfortable. Nobody's likes nobody like leaning into these conversations. Um, and I think uh, it's very important to have, but we got to be careful that we don't become reactionary. So we have these conversations reacting to, um, I think as believers, we have to have these conversations because we are responsible for being the light of the world. So I call it the gap theory that if we as believers don't fill in the gap, the world will. So, and the world doesn't um, adhere to the principles of Jesus. So it, it, so it, it's problematic when we can't have conversations. It's problematic when we can't have dialogue. And I think um, we have to be able to lean into those spaces. And so for me personally, um, I'm leaning hard into those spaces and I'm refusing to live in a state of, okay, I don't want to offend this person. Okay, I got to make sure I don't, I, I can't live like that. Um, Jesus said offenses must come. And so we have to, as, as, as leaders, we have to lead, we have to lean into those spaces and we have to lean with the spirit of God leading us into those spaces. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Antoine. Um, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you, you've been in a, in a, in a place where, you know, you a pastor, but you a husband also. And, and, you know, and you, you got a, me personally, you know, I have a wife that's like, you know, it hit her, you know, in a way that as a mother, you know what I'm saying? And then I have to, you know, um, minister to her, like, you know, why is this like, you know, you know, what, you know, what's really going on. And, um, and I'm just having real conversations, you know, and, and like, you know, I, I can't sugarcoat it, you know? And, and so I think when we attack the issue head on with, okay, so what are we going to do? You know, um, we didn't talk long enough. Now uh, I'm, I'm always kind of strategic, you know? So now my whole thing is, so, so now what we're going to do strategically coming out of this, you know, how are we going to mobilize, you know, are we sitting at the tables, to make decisions, are we sitting at the tables where it's gonna count? You know, um, you know, and so that's that's my whole thing. And then, you know, I received a phone call because you know we we met we have mentees and um, which is our juvenile part of Fathers on the Move, and and I received a phone call from one of our uh, mentees' mother, and she was crying, calling me because she was fearful of her just turned eighteen year old son going out the house. You know, and she's, you know, she asking me, what do I do? You know, and so that that hit home, you know, for me. And, and to hear that mother crying over, you know, wanting to protect her baby, you know. And so, and so one of the things I, I was thankful for is that I assured her that we're holding our police department accountable, you know. And so, and so, you know, that's something we had already been engaged in because I know the importance of sitting at those tables. And so, um, and so, being able to to assure her that you know, um, uh, our, our police chief that you know he he has an open door policy, you know, and and uh, and, and I think that's where we as believers uh, can can make an impact because we must be relational, you know, we must be relational and with those people 
you know, that, you know, that have influence. And so, and so with that, um, you know, I think that's kind of where we can do our most damage at, you know, is sitting on those boards um, and, and being a part of those uh, decision-making and policies, you know, uh, procedure and policy. You know, we, we're actually, I'm so grateful that uh, even before, right before this pandemic hit, our police chief is now uh, making his rookies come and sit in Fathers on the Move classes at our graduations, you know, because he wants them to see that people can change. You know, they can go in one way and come out another way, you know, and so, um, and so I think it's all about accountability. You know, are we holding our local officials accountable? You know, and, and, and so that's kind of where we are. And then as uh, far as last days, our members, and I'm, at, I'm telling them, no, vent, let it out. Don't, don't hold it in. You know what I'm saying? You need to exhale and let that thing out of you. You know, if you need to scream, scream, you know, and, and then, you know, get yourself together and now, okay, so what are we going to do? You know, and so, and so that's kind of where we're at right now, um, you know, dealing with, you know, the emotions, you know, and feelings of, you know, um, our people. And, and then I, I'm so grateful that, you know, I've been receiving calls and emails from our white brethren saying, what can we do? You know, and, and that's been a blessing, you know, um, to get calls and emails saying, okay, Victor, how can we, you know, do our part as, you know, white brothers and sisters? You know, I said, well, you're doing it now because you, you want to have a conversation and, 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 and talk about this you know, and then come up with a strategic plan moving forward, you know, that, you know, how we voice our opinions now, it does matter, you know, and having a conversation. All right. That's some great stuff. And we'll go deeper into some of those things you guys talked about. But I, I wanted to kind of maybe shift back from this, um, these incidences to talk about, uh, I'm, you ever heard the phrase, uh, I don't know what I don't know? Um, as a white pastor leader, can you just tell me what I don't know that I need to know so, coming into this um, situation? So, so I think awareness, number one. Like, I think sometimes we give people the answers before we hear their hearts. So oftentimes when I'm in these white spaces, I hear stuff like, um, do you know this FBI statistics on police, pro police brutality? Um, and majority of folks who are experiencing police brutality are white Americans. So what is, where is the outcry with that? And so sometimes what happens is people don't listen. They, they come up with their own way to navigate those spaces. So we got to learn how to listen because that same number, which I think is roughly around 55% of all police brutality um, involve white Americans. And that number for African-Americans is 27%. So if you just take the numbers at face value, you say this happens more to white people than it does African-Americans. Well, when you dig deeper, if African-Americans only make up 12.7% of the U.S. population, yet the incidence of police brutality is more than double the, demo, the, um, the proportion then you have a skewed view of those numbers. So I think you have to go into these conversations, like, and, and then I think um, white Americans represent 72% of, of um, the US population. So if you go into these spaces, not listening, you come with your own set of experiences. And I think what ends up happening is there's no common ground. So we need to learn how to listen to people because we know as believers, that Jesus is the answer, but you don't even give me an opportunity to pose the question, <laughs> the answer to what? <laughs> like, so um, there's a theology of suffering that, um, that some um, African-American churches in the South um, preach, because when you think about the reason why there's a black church, because we were segregated from the white church. So you got to dig deeper beyond the surface information that many of us have. So when I talk to um, my, my white brothers, you know, I need for them to listen first, like literally listen to the heart. Because when I'm listening to um, the guys on the street or the guys in my church, I'm listening first. 
like, and sometimes what we have a tendency to do, we listen to respond. So that's not real dialogue. So we don't have to go back and forth with statistics and the media's manipulation. Man, I get it. You're absolutely right. The, the, the media is manipulating all of this. I get it. But that doesn't mean that people aren't suffering. That doesn't mean people are not feeling the weight of oppression. And so um, when, when the video of George Floyd came out, literally, and this is what I was talking to my wife about, I felt nothing, man. Like, I, it, I don't know if it was my way of dealing with it because I'm, my son is 18 years old and, you know, we spend his week celebrating his valedictorian status and stuff like that with the conversation <laughs> about George Floyd. So for me, it was, I was just, I was numb until on uh, last Thursday, I'm on my way uh, to the office and I'm listening to all the statistics. I'm listening to all this other stuff. And, um, I'm literally driving my car and I see two police officers and dude, I just started crying. And it's, it's that tension of the hope of Christ that will come back. The perfect has not, will return with the tension of living in our present reality, knowing that it's not as simple as, well, if he would just comply. If So if, if I was a, a pastor who did not have the experiences that my congregants um, had, I would seek to understand. I would be quiet and rest in that moment. It's the book of Job, um, chapter three, chapter four. It's Job's friends for seven days set with him. And so sometimes as family, because we are the family of God, we don't sit with our family members. We just come straight to solutions. And this is what should happen. And you know, the scripture speaks of this. Sometimes what I need for you to do is mourn with me. Sometimes I just, I just need for you to grieve with me. You don't have to have the answers. And I think sometimes we're wired to try to fix something that's beyond our ability. So just sit with me in it. And it's what Victor said, man, I totally agree. You got pastors who are, who are reaching out saying, what can I do? What can I do? And that's a start. But beyond the words, let's actually do something. Like, let's not be guilt into reaction. Okay, how can we, what can I do? Because let's be honest, if you are in predominantly white spaces and you don't have many African-Americans in your congregation, this may seem light years away from you. But you can talk about sin and, the, and racism is a sin. You have to deal with you first and Lord, search my heart, evaluate my own heart, because sometimes we can't lean into those spaces because we are dealing with those same spaces. We just not, uh, we're just not honest with it. So I think you, you have to have... Um, you have to have these conversations. Right. Victor, what don't I know that I need to know? Yeah, I'm going to give you a, a real live example just this weekend. Uh, Dr. Bruce Coates from Weinbrenner Seminary uh, reached out to me and was like, well, look, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how can an educated white man like me, you know, have a voice in or, you know, make an impact in what's, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, first of all, you're reaching out to me now. Next, what can we do? And, and, and he came up as, as we went on through the conversation and he, you know, he, he began to say, well, how about I bring you into the circles of, uh, of my circles and speak on this thing, you know, so that we can have dialogue. So what Antoine said, so we can listen, so we can, we can talk about it. You know, and I think that's kind of where we need to go is that, you know, we need to come into our white brethren spaces. And, and, I, and I have done this in ERC, so I'm, I'm very humble and grateful, you know, that a lot of our pastors have allowed me to come in into their churches and speak and whatnot. But now let's take it to the next level, you know, and talk about those hard conversations that we never probably will bring out or we would just talk behind closed doors you know, but now bringing it to the forefront, you know, and, and let's get it out in the open and, and let's attack the issue at hand. 
you know, and then, you know, let's repent together. And, and, and you know, and if you find that somewhere in your heart, you know, let's repent, you know, and, and get it right, you know, and then, okay, so now moving forward, um, you know, what are we going to be uh, consistently a part of to say we're not going to tolerate that, in, a, in you know, by no form, way, or fashion? All right. That's some good stuff. Um, I, pre I really appreciate you guys sharing, and, and uh, hopefully this helps. Uh, at least it does help me. Uh, here, here's some tough questions, all right? And so, again, these are things that I hear, see on Facebook people are wrestling with, and so I, I, I think we just hit it as it is. This whole um, white blame versus responsibility, Where? how do we handle all that? I mean, a lot of people push back on some of these issues of, you know, completely blaming whiteness in some ways um, versus, and again, I'm just asking, how do we help people walk through this? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Like, it's crazy because, you know, you get that all the time. So sometimes um, you hear things like, uh, let's just wait and see. Um, you hear, um, we don't have all the facts. Um, um, you know, this guy wasn't, um, this guy wasn't, uh, a choir boy. And it's very interesting to me because, uh, we can't even mourn a person's death without having a caveat to his character. Like if we are created in the image of God, like we understand that from the new, the, the unborn, we get it. Like, you know, we have to defend the voiceless and we march because we are so passionate about um, the unborn. But then when a person reaches a certain, certain age, you know, man, don't work, you don't eat. It's like we have these these absolutes that we carry wherever we go. So I think um, there is enough uh, sin to go around. And it's what Victor said. It's. I have to learn how to grieve the sin that I commit. I have to learn how to grieve the sin that's committed, committed against me. And then I have to learn how to grieve the, the sin that people commit against each other. And what I'm seeing is this cold approach to the gospel. So there's always two sides. It's preach the gospel, Reverend. That's what you call to do, preach the gospel. And then the other side is um, I feed the poor feed the hungry. And so I don't see how they are polar opposites. Like I don't see how they um, can't coexist. So what we can't do is point the blame, but we can take responsibility. So it's personal. So when you see stuff like what's been happening, um, the average person, and I believe this not to be a fallacy, I just think it's how we react. You know, personally, you know, I'm not responsible for that. And you're right. And but it invades our social space. So we see it and we 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 we're hard. We, we, we're it hurts us and we see the humanity. And then we sometimes and this is what Victor is doing, I think, probably better. Than most if yeah, like 90 percent. Then it's the system, it's systematic. So it affected Victor personally, and then he moved from it being personal to his social space. And now he's moving within the system. And now he's changing it from a broad. Now that's the talent, that's a calling, that's a skill. That's something that God orchestrates. But the personal space is where None of us know the personal space is the hardest space because that is where you look at, you look within and you say, how am I contributing to dot, dot, dot? Cause that's because we're not asking you to do what Victor is doing, going to federal prisons. That's you got to be called to that, but your personal thing may be, okay, I may not be able to go into those prisons, but I can, I don't know, resource his ability to do that. But personally, if you don't grieve your own sin in your heart, it will never change you. The reason why we are 
Christians, it's because we have seen the glory of God through, through Christ Jesus. And that has showed us his holiness and showed us our wretchedness. So we don't even come to God without acknowledging our sin. Why can't we acknowledge the sin of racism that's not in the system, that's not in the social, but it's in our own hearts? Because if we don't get to the point where we don't see our own sin and we start looking at when people react and people respond the way they respond, we do, we keep doing this. We, ju we just keep pointing fingers and we're saying they need to take personal responsibility for the blah, blah, blah. And that may be true, but it's what the scripture says. You have a log in your own eye, but see a speck in theirs. And I think if we don't take this moment to say, okay, where's the sin in my life that's expressed through prejudice, that's expressed through racism? What we'll end up doing is we'll start disconnecting from the humanity of people. We'll become angry by their reactions. And then we begin to judge their reactions without hearing the cries of their hearts. And what's happening, whether we like it or not, and, and there is a cry that the earth is travailing and is waiting for the sons of God. And if we don't get to that, if we don't get to that realization that the world is responding in a way that does not glorify God, and then we just keep pointing our finger, we are to give them Jesus. We are going, we are first responders, and we go into those hard places knowing that it's the grace of God that we that we are actually called to go to those hard places. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's and that's that's good because we're quick to try to throw the blame. For instance, you know, like, for instance, like, oh, well, he, he the first thing they'll try to do is uh, bring up his background, you know, and, and throw it out there, you know, and, oh, well, he was this and that. He's a human being. No human being should experience something like that. What if that was your son, niece, nephew, whatever? You know what I'm saying? Bottom line. You know, at the end of the day, we all bleed the same color, you know. And so, you know, so that's where I see that, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't, you know, bring up someone's background or past. You know, let's deal with the issue at hand. No, no man, no one should die like that. Bottom line. You know what color you are, you know. And then I'm going to go on our side culturally. Um, I was watching yesterday and some 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 black pastor friends and they was outraged. They, and one of the things they spoke about was, well, why didn't us black pastors um, uh, speak on it Sunday morning services rather than being about Pentecostal Sunday, you know, and why we aren't, you know what I'm saying, using our pulpits, you know what I'm saying, to, to uh, uh, stress that over the, no, 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 no. No, it's, it's what you do outside of your pulpit that's going to make the difference. You know, that's not the platform because, you know, even with yesterday, some people needed a word from the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Through this time, they needed some, some strength. They needed some encouragement because people are in pain. They hurting. That's not the, that's not the platform that I use. I use it where it counts the most, you know, sitting at those tables, you know, uh, seeing policies done and holding people accountable, you know. So, so I see it from both sides, you know, and and that's one of the things that you know. And I deal, you know, y'all know I deal with guys, uh, uh, process, you know, and work, you know, and so that they still kind of hard. I mean, really, uh, you know, and they and they want to blame, you know, the white man. And I'm like, dude, don't do that. You know what I'm saying? You know, and, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to change the game. I literally bring the chief of police and them into our class, you know, because our mentalities, you know, so I'm trying to break that cycle, you know, and so um, so that's just, you know, that whole blame thing is is something else, man. But in the end of the day, we, we're all human beings, bottom line. All right, um, I'm going to give you – how do you balance um, in, in this people's hearts versus broken systems? And I think there's both, right? I mean, I, I think in some way, how do you, as I wrestle with this, is like, how do I, I can't change um, some people's hearts. You know, I, I present the gospel. I, 
but I can help with systems. But some of the systems are so big that I can't even help with those. Do, how, how do I, how do I, rat, how do I think through systems, people's hearts, and how do I maneuver in that, that realm? Victor? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you know, um, it starts right in your backyard, okay? And it, it's not as big as you, you're perceiving it to be. It starts right in your own local backyard and dealing with the system from your own local level. You know, what you say I'm saying? That means that I encourage you as a pastor to go to those meetings um, and show up, you know, and, you know, and, and, and let your voice be heard that, you know, what are we doing for whatever particular matter, okay? And so that's how I think we can begin to make change, you know, in our own backyard. Because if we're gonna, if we're gonna see anything move or happen, it starts right where you at, you know? And, and so that means that, you know, I sit on several boards in our county. I'm talking about the highest boards in our county. I sit with the mayor, the, the, the chiefs, uh, the county commissioners, all those, because that's where we need to be at. That's where our voice needs to be heard, you know? And so, you know, and you might think, well, um, how can I, you know, you can help, you can, brain change, you can um, make things happen right from a local level. It's, it's not as big as we think it are. And, and, it, and it starts right there. And then it systematically moves. Ask me how I know. I mean, literally, I've, I've gone from a community setup to going to DC, speaking to Congress, then going to the, speak to the Department of Justice, you know, so, so it all started from a local level. You know, right there in my own backyard, you know, being an advocate, you know, uh, being a mouthpiece. And then it just did that, you know. So so it's not as big sometimes, or we might think, oh, I can't make a difference, and my boys can't make a, you know, yes, it can. So from the, from the local church, so, uh, you know, we, we, we run sermon series, and we discuss issues that are relevant to our congregants. So we'll have um, sermon series on generosity and how you handle your money. Uh, we'll have sermon series on family and how to, you know, make uh, disciples of your children and the responsibility of parents. We'll have marriage series. We'll have a marriage series about, you know, how to love your wife like Christ loved the church. We'll have, we have how important it is to take care of your body because the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have workshops that are geared towards certain elements that quite frankly are relevant, culturally appropriate, dot, dot, dot. So, and, and we use the pulpit as a way because that's a, that's a high platform. So whether you got 20 people, whether you got 2000 people, that pulpit is the gateway to your audience. And um, so you can leverage the pulpit but it's what Victor says. It doesn't stay in the pulpit. So it's it's the whole cultural shift that to me, this is a byproduct of fatherlessness on both sides, as well as the lack of discipleship. Because in Charlotte, I am seeing the act activists who are not Christ-centered take the leading role in this movement. And and so I'm saying, okay, wow. And then I'm 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 researching these guys and I'm seeing like their hearts and they have nonviolent practices. And then there were some, there's there's three guys that I've identified that um, one of them has history with the church, but's no longer involved with the church. The other um was the son of a pastor, I think, and then the other has no history with the church. So I sit back and I look and say, man we are failing and missing opportunities to disciple these brothers to be able to lead this movement. And so what I'm, and you know, and I, and I believe Victor thinks the same way that I do, like I'm trying to move out of the way. I'm trying to move from the feature to the facilitator. 
and start building platforms for other guys so that they can reach the generation that's right at this cusp. And I realized my limitations and my experience, because even with me and Victor, we, we, we are not homogeneous, like homogeneous, like we, we, we are different. Like we have different experiences. And so we can't speak for the entire African-American experience. So we are limited um, based on us. We can just have our shared experiences. I'm saying all that to say that there are places in our own lives that we can leverage for the sake of the gospel. And we haven't done that. So that's why we see what Victor is doing as hard and I can't do that. Well, the truth of the matter is we're not leveraging the spaces that we do have influence. That's right. we, we, so we, we're not leveraging, um, even in, as a denomination, if we don't leverage the resources to leverage our attention, target specific areas, then we just shooting all over the place. And so if we continue to, as Christ followers to be reactionary, so here's, what, here's what's going to happen, and I hope that it doesn't. So this is the moment that the church can capitalize on because it, it, it lets you know that there's a gospel need that's just experienced throughout this country. And so we're going to talk about it and we're going to write action steps. And then the monotony of our day stuff happens and we stop talking about it. We start meeting about it. It's I listen to Victor and it's like now I want to call the chief of police and it's like I want to get involved with these boards and then we're going to be low back to sleep until something else wakes us all up again and we keep going through this cycle because in Charlotte, Keith Lamont Scott got killed three and a half years ago and I'm going to be honest with you, I was navigating such a tense place as the church merged it was hard. So I just, honestly, man, and I repented to my people and I repented to God. I didn't feel that I could properly address it. So I didn't. I just kept pointing people back to Jesus, kept pointing people back to Jesus. Well, lo and behold, three and a half months now, and my city's on fire. So I can't, if, if this does not become a part of the gospel that's expressed, then we're gonna keep reacting to what God knows that he's the answer to. And so what Victor did, when I, when I listened to his um, sermon on Sunday, man, he preached the Holy Spirit. The, he, you didn't see, you did, he preached the gospel, man. But when he moves beyond that pulpit, he's living it. So he's not just using the pulpit as a way to preach something that he doesn't practice. And so we have to be careful that we don't preach against racism, but we practice it. Like it, it's, it's it, what my heart breaks for is, is not churches that don't know what to do. My heart breaks for the churches who just talking. Like, and that because Talking satisfies the part of me that don't want to be uncomfortable. Like, I'm going to tell you what's crazy. I'm so bent on making people comfortable that I'm not even preaching the full gospel because the full gospel says it costs you. So we tiptoe about not being uncomfortable and getting out your box. And he says, except you lay down your life. And, and so what we're seeing is a church that has the power that only God can give us that has become impotent. And so I applaud in my city the 3,000 people that showed up on Sunday afternoon and multiple churches. And man, that was a beautiful display of the kingdom. But you know what happened when the sun went down? The church went back to their homes. And people were getting tear, tear gassed. And so this thing cost us. It, it, and, and the part that I'm being convicted with, I don't think it cost me. It, it cost Victor to do what he's doing. 
but it's for the sake of the cross of Christ. And what's happening is it's not costing us. And so think about, think about what we're seeing displayed. Think about your own personal reaction to it and the helplessness that you may feel because you want to do something. I beseech you, my dear brothers, to pray with a pure heart because I believe that the Holy Spirit will answer that prayer of what could I do? What should I do? The problem is, do you really want to do it? Because that's what it boils down to. We got the answers, bros. Like, we, my brothers and sisters, man, we have the answers. That, that goes without question. The problem is, do we have the resolve? Right. And I'll, I'll tell you where I, part of my frustration right now is the rhetoric um, in my, inside of my church of the frustration of saying something and doing, and I understand there's a lament and there is a saying something, but I want to move them past saying, posting whatever article to like, let's, let's mobilize you. If, let's mobilize our people to do something rather than just the rhetoric of talking. I just get sick of the talking. I can't even look at Facebook anymore because of all the, Back and forth, and, and so, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, you there, see, I have so many see, questions, but uh, I just don't have enough time to ask it, all yeah. of them. But do, you see, but do you see, like, the importance of, like, um, discipleship and your personal calling? Because right. we're mobilizing volunteers and not mobilizing disciples. So think about this. So volunteers, we set up, we break down, we, we work with inside the four walls of the church, and then... Like I, I have been tempering. I, I have a lot of things I want to say, but I realize it's what you're saying, Mike. Okay, I got to do stuff because I'm I'm talking with pastors who, and we should do not get me wrong because that's part of our purview. It's part of our space at the moment. But we are so focused of getting back to church, getting back into the four walls of the church, getting back into it. It's like, man, I can't wait until we worship. Dude, I'm a worshiper. I love to worship. But I'm watching Rome burn. And I'm literally running inside. Like, <laughs> this is the craziest thing in the world to me. And I'm not saying we shouldn't gather. I'm not saying, but we're focusing so much of our energies in returning to the norm. And the Hebrews of, you know, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. And brothers, we shouldn't. But as the world is on fire, figuratively, what we're seeing is why the church is no longer at the table. And that is what Victor is saying, that we have to sort of go back to what Jesus did. Jesus was radical. Jesus was not this guy who just came on the scene with locks and flowing hair and just kumbaya. No, Jesus turned tables. It's time for the church once again, to flip the tables over. And what we have done is become complacent complacent in this chaos, and he's calling us higher. Yeah, and, th and let me say, you know, I remember when I first came into the ERC, right, uh, as a church planner, you know, I went through assessment and all that. But one of the things ERC was like, um, they gave me benchmarks. You know what I'm saying? And, and you want to, you know, I had to hit those benchmarks. I think as a body, a church, we need to set benchmarks and then be consistently in attacking those benchmarks so that we can see that, okay, check, we're doing this. Check, we're doing this. And, and I think that's where we hold each other accountable to that very fact. You know what I'm saying? Accountability, you know, and, and then we can see, okay, um, that's how you, you, you measure your, your success or your results by, you know what, are we attacking the very things that we say we want to make a difference in and then hold each other accountable to that, you know, and, and then you, you begin to check off, check off, you know, okay, okay, we're doing this. Okay. And it ain't gotta be all on the pastor. You know, we, we got to mobilize, mobilize together. You know, I send, I, I have high level meetings. I'm able to send some of our guys to go sit in my okay. stand. You know what I'm saying? To go and, and sit in the meeting. And they know that they represent fathers on the move the last days when they show up at that meeting. You know, so so it's outside, it's even more outside of us as pastors. No, our congregations gotta be ready to mobilize. 
you know, and then we work together. And I think when we work together, we can get more accomplished. We can see more results and, and we can make, and we can see things happen. Praise the Lord. Right. Uh, I have, uh, let me give you three questions, um, one at a time, but I think um, three more will an ask and answer. Um, one is, uh, it's from Colleen, but I'm going to change it in my perspective a little bit. So I have three older kids and I adopted a kid, uh, a daughter who's six years old, who's African American. How do I raise each of those? So I, how do I disciple them in this, um, to be able to, um, Colleen says, raise up the next generation to be the change on our communities and world. So how do I, how do I disciple them? And it might, might be different, might be the same, but, uh, you know, I have the two contexts and trying to, and I, again, I've never you know, I, I don't know how much culture she needs, how much I need. To, does it make? I, I, how do I disciple both my kids to be people who make a difference in this culture, in this world, uh, especially when it comes to race? <laughs> um, Eric Mason said that um, that we can get a man to the moon and Mar and working on Mars and can't figure out relationships. Um, because relationships speak to like a lot, man. And so you, you got different, you got a different um, context than most. So, you know, you raise your children, obviously, you know, uh, in a godly home that you may, you see them as disciples. You see them literally as, you know, when Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So first we gotta have a relationship with God. Like, so that has to be nurtured and we are the godly examples. Then you gotta have a relationship with yourself. You gotta believe that you are who God says you are through Christ Jesus. Because if you don't get those two things right, then relationship with other people is messed up. So you gotta have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with yourself, and then you have a relationship with other people. So in the different context, it's like, you know, the family home, the, the church is, is not like family. The church is family. So your home is a church. And so you got your disciples that you're making. And sometimes the reason why people can't deal with conflict is because they don't understand conflict resolution. So sometimes what parents would do is hide the conflict from their children. No, no, no. They got to see the, the, the disconnection between you and your wife, and then they got to see the reconnection because these are patterns that we're literally showing our children. We're showing them how to break up, make up, break up, make up. And so in your context, you got the, it's, it's what you're already doing. You got, the, you got to love them, love them like Christ and continuously point them to Christ, knowing that you're, you are limited, that they got to have to come to their own knowledge of Jesus Christ and they have to come and accept Christ as their savior. But you and I as parents have to get out of the way of um, trying to sort of push them to God. They have to experience God for themselves, but we can create the atmosphere for them to do so. And then we have to speak boldly and truthfully of those different experiences that the color that we see expressed through humanity is God's gift to us. And we have to reframe what the world says. See, when we, that there's an opportunity that we have here, that there are times when things that I see are not racial. They're not, but the narrative makes them racial. So we have to speak to the truth of the gospel while not sugarcoating anything. And then we also got to know that even if Mike and your wife are the best parents that you can potentially be you're still not enough that's why we need christ and so i think those experiences that you have with your african-american daughter you 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 still continue to nurture that cultural piece it's like the dinner table is the most powerful teacher when you have people of different colors different races literally sitting at your dinner table because we can preach about it and not live it so those things i think are practical things that we can all do but the challenge is the awareness behind it. You don't have to be her African-American dad. You're not. You need to be her dad. But her experience is something that you're going to have to navigate by having conversations and friends and have friends who are who have that same shared experience. Amen. 
Um, yeah, and, and I go, and I it all goes back to, for me discipleship. You know what you're discipling your 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 children, and and how you teach them, and and I teach my kids culturally. You know, I'm I'm gonna give you an, an example. Two years ago, we was on vacation. And we was in Wilmington at the aquarium, and uh, my my oldest son, he was uh, 15 then, and, and that we experienced our first racial situation, you know, and he literally heard an, another a white kid say the N word, and he came, he was hurt. He was like, well, why? And, and this was his response to that, and it really touched my heart. He said, Dad, why why would they like that? Why aren't they like Chuck, Rich, and Colleen? Did you hear me? And that blew me away. And it's because what we have our kids around and what they see, you know, and, and the context or the uh, us being relational with the people that we do Christ with, that we do life with. And so they, they're seeing that. So, so he's seeing that, well, why aren't that individual that said that negative word, why aren't they like the people that we be around when, 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 you know, our white brothers and sisters, you know, and he literally specifically said, Chuck, Rich, and Colleen, why aren't they like them? You know, and then I, that was a teachable moment. So I had to teach him right then, okay, son, you know, everybody is not like that, but you know what? He, you know, here's how we deal with that. And so it, it's what we, you know, embed into our kids. You know, we, we must teach them. And it's that one word, love, you know, and, and you know, we got to love our neighbor as thyself. And it's no matter what color they are, you know? And so uh, I, I think it all starts at home. So, um, yep. so yeah. yeah. And then yep. th don't, don't be ashamed to teach them uh, that, that child, their culture, you know, so that they'll know their culture. I teach our kids, Black history stuff that's not in the books, in the school books. I do teach that, you know, and so that they can know um, their history and their ancestors and stuff like that and their roots. And so it's important. We must educate our kids. All right. Um, two more. Uh, one is, uh, again, uh, Nick's on the call and there's a few other leaders. What, is, what can the C Eastern Region, CGDC, do to help um, – navigate like what 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 should be some practical steps for the eastern region in this season or even and not even season really longer than that but as we navigate this i i, I shoot like there are times when the foundation of a thing is so corrupted that you have to un you got to up you got to redo everything like sometimes with institutions they are so corrupted and corroded that the response is a knee-jerk reaction to burn everything down so it's so uh, a friend of mine, his foundation is messed up. And so what they're doing is they got ram jack in and they're trying to fix the foundation. They got to go real, real deep and put all this this technical stuff that I am so not um, skilled or versed on. So the reason why. Uh, I never forget the one time in October, I believe it's 2015. Uh, Victor and I, first time we went to Finland, Ohio. And man, I was in a horrible place, man. Like, dude. And so that seven hour ride, man, Victor was ministering to me. And so when we went to Finland, Ohio, um, we went to the uh, historical archives and, and walking through. And um, I think the gentleman's name was Plessy, if I'm not mistaken. But you see uh, Weinbrenner being able uh, um, um, being against slavery and you see that the foundation of the denomination was founded on the got the, the true representation of the gospel and so oftentimes when i'm speaking to other organizations i would i would tell them man in my heart i wouldn't say this out loud but it's more like yo your whole foundation messed up <laughs> like uh, you you can't even you you can't even start to e unravel it you, it's a thread it's a thread that just goes so deep go back to your first love go back to the truth 
that this denomination was built on. Because when you start seeing that the foundation was rooted and poured out correctly, that's, dude, that's rare. So sometimes I think that we just got to go back to the full expression of the gospel. And it's a long, hard journey. Because when you look at it, that um, churches were, 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 were ran out of the South. When you look at the history, because they were speaking the gospel and, and how it was every nation, every tongue. So when we get away from the truth of God's word and how it's expressed, and so as a denomination, what we simply have to do is go back to what the, the, the church of God was founded on. And that is the beauty. But we also have to have hard conversations about where we are now. See, in relationships, we have to leave room to be offended. And that's what we struggle with. And, and so I have to know that, Mike, you may say something that's stupid. And if we are in relationship, we, I should be able to handle it because I know the intent of your heart. But if we don't start these conversations, we'll just dance around it, and then I will be offended. I won't say anything, and then I and then I peel away, and that's what we can't afford to do. Because think about it, we are sin exhausted. This is one more thing we got to talk about. It's like we talking about multiplication, we talking about discipleship, we talking about pastoring through the pandemic, and now you sprinkle racism in it. It's tiresome. But for the sake of the cross, we have to have these conversations. So we move from having the conversations and leaving space to be offended to ask, like what, what Victor said, benchmarks. What does diversity look like in my context? Because if I'm in rural Pennsylvania and it's 100% white, I probably won't get an African-American to come to my church. But what I can do is, is, is yeah, it's what Colleen just said. We have to be a people of grace where I extend grace and I'm also giving grace. And that is what we have to create. So we got to have the conversations. We got to also make sure that we're planting churches in the context of the areas of the church, because you may desire a multi-ethnic church, but if you're in rural Pennsylvania and 100% of your people are white, unless God does something different, that won't happen. But you do have to also extend grace and make sure that you're in these conversations to learn, to understand, and to move forward. I would just add one, extend grace, yes, but I think what we don't do, too, is speak truth sometimes. Like, grace I need to extend truth. grace, but I need to speak truth, too. If I'm doing something really stupid, I, I need you to say, we, we need that voice. And then I need to have the, the grace of, like, I'm not going to be offended because you're speaking truth to me. Yeah. Uh, Victor. Um, you know, Antoine, you know I love you, man, because we so, you know, connected because the whole time – the one thing I was thinking about was that trip when we first went to Finley. That was, you know, <laughs> that's what came to my mind. And then we walked through the museum and, and saw the history of, um, of the churches of God. And, and, and if, if you remember, Antoine, when we looked at all the pictures up on the wall, I said, what's one thing that's missing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and what what that was is you didn't see, you know, and I know what we were founded on and all that through the years, but you didn't see no person of color. And so and so literally I said, you know what, we're gonna change this. Okay. And, yeah, and so yeah. you know, and, and I said to myself, you know, early on, you know, even when I uh came into ERC, I said, you know, one thing that I see right out the gate. You know, we're going to have to have people of color and other different uh, ethnicity backgrounds in leadership. Um, and, and if we're going to make a change, you know, far as the denominational, far as the region, we, ha we must have more people diversity in leadership. Um, you know, and, um, and so I, I think that's kind of where, you know, we can attack those issues and, and, and um, you know, um, and so... Yeah, so for me, that's kind of where I see it, you know, and just having that, you know, that different lingo uh, and dialect coming from, you know, a different perspective. All right. 
Uh, my last question, I know we're going over a little long, but I, I, I've really enjoyed this. I appreciate you guys sharing. I know you'll share it more tomorrow. Um, give me, I, both of you, I think both of you posted, or I talked to Victor and Antoine posted something about, here are the practical steps a church can take, a leader can take, a pastor can take in the midst of this. And I know we've, you've hinted at it, you've said some things, um, be but as practical as possible for a rural white church in Pennsylvania or in New York, give us, give us some practical steps. Go ahead, Antoine. I was going to concede to the gentleman from uh, Raleigh. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think it's real. I think everything has to be la led by prayer. Um, and that seems like one of those, um, it seems like one of those things that's cop out. So uh, sometimes when I'm talking to folks who are ready to do something, it's always something like, um, it's all, that's all you say. We, we pray, we pray. Yeah, we don't pray only, but we do pray first. We pray continually. We pray always. So I think we got to be led because how do you jump into something that you're unfamiliar with? So I, I always say start with prayer first with a sincere heart asking God to reveal your own prejudices, your own racism, whatever it is, the cross of Christ also deals with your own sin and the, the ugly sins. And, and you don't have to sanitize it. You don't have to pretend it doesn't exist. If you walk somewhere and you see an African-American brother and, and, and you take a pause, if, I mean, dude, you just got to admit that to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit literally worked through your heart and stop denying that it exists. So I think you start with prayer. And then I think you actually resource churches beyond your own. And, and, and so sometimes what I see happening is we just duplicate ourselves, which, okay, but there's different expressions. And then you have to see the need for missions. But you also got to recognize that Jesus didn't show up because you planted your church. Jesus has always been working behind the scenes. And so sometimes what I see people will do is say, yeah, there's no gospel centered churches in that area. Really? Like, how, how do you know that? And so sometimes we don't contextualize um, that we're in. So I think you start off with prayer with a pure heart. You resource churches be, um, beyond your own. And you, you have to do these things. I think my internet's messing up, but, um, and then you have to be culturally competent. Now this is a, this is where I think it's a landmine. Cultural appropriation is when you use something from a culture you're not familiar with and you try to make it your own. So sometimes it's like, I meet people who talk, uh, they, 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 I don't know, they're trying to relate or, and they find themselves talking back like that you you got to have cultural competent competency man so if you are if you're in a rural area you may not necessarily relate to a person who's in this from the city but you do have shared experiences that you got to find common ground on but i think the biggest thing is prayer seek to understand and then sometimes and this is a big one that you have to you have to step aside and let somebody else's guide guide you, somebody else lead. Um, because I posted something that some pastors reached out to me uh, a few days ago that said that um, if you don't understand the times that we're living in, that means your time has passed. And that's a hard, brutal statement. Because if you're still looking at what was, then my suggestion to all of us is to under, to pray that we lead somebody with us to help navigate these times. And that is where multiplication is important. Multiplication isn't multipl multiplying me, but infiltrating the culture with little small Jesuses everywhere that we go. So if we don't have that, if we don't have, if we're not intentional, then we're trying to stumble onto something that takes an intentional spirit led approach to. And I think if we don't do that, then we're going to end up on the other side of history. And that's what, um, I think that's the, that's what we have to do. We, uh, yeah, it's what Nick said, live Jesus in every circumstance. Like we literally have to do that. Uh, 
Yep, and I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, so I'm 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 say okay, um, like like for instance, like Warsaw, um, our Warsaw location is rural. I mean, you know, and we wanted to see how could we, you know, how could we make a difference, um, you know, moving into a rural area, and and so we literally figured out how we we actually set up a computer lab to help the kids and so follow me what i'm trying to say is that we saw what the need was for that moment in that particular rural town and we attacked it so what i would say is uh how can you help in you know rural areas well i think it's it's like we do when we church plant we look at the demographics you know, when we go in and, and what's this and what's that. And so I would say, you know, if we're going to try to make a difference. I don't care if it's, if it's rural, inner city or whatever. We got to be able to look at what's going on and and, have, and strategically have people to go in those circles and take notes. And then that's where we're praying. And then we're asking God, you know, for clarity and direction on where we need to move. And everybody may not need to move in the same circle. You know what I'm saying? So so in other words, what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, I mean, we can open up our local newspaper and see that, okay, this particular meeting is is happening. Well, are we at that meeting? Are we, uh, are, are we listening? You know, are, are we hearing what's going on in our rural setting? You know, and, and, and sometimes we think, you know, there's so much different, but I like, even when I'm in meetings with like, um, and, it's, and that's that's high level uh, chief FBI and all these people, and we're talking about the opioid problem, where there's just as much as an opioid problem in the city as in the rural. So so they go hand in hand, you know? And so, um, and I think, so that's where I would say for a rural church is to identify get in the circle, and then that's that's where you attack. Be faithful over a few things, and I'll make you rule over many. So I just think we we start right there where we can see we can we can go in strategically and uh, and make a difference. All right. Um, I think we'll end it there today, but I really do appreciate you guys um, and your ministries uh, where you're at, but also uh, the voice that you have um, here in the eastern region, I think. Um, you, what you brought today, what, what you said today, um, just so much good stuff that we need to hear. And I know you'll have more tomorrow. So here's my announcement. Here's my commercial tomorrow at 10. I think you guys are with uh, Rich and Chuck. And so they'll let me ask some more questions. Um, but I don't think this is a two day thing either. I think personally, I think this is a conversation we need to keep. We can't let it drift just because the news cycle drifts. We need to keep these conversations going and hold each other accountable in some ways to, um, making sure we're living out the gospel um, in all its facets and, and its unity. And so, um, yeah, I just, I, I appreciate both of you um, and just the ministries that you have and how you've challenged me. So uh, what I think we'll do, do one of you want to pray us out? Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Father, we just say thank you for this time together. And Lord, we, you know, you said we're two or three are gathered in your name, you in the midst. And so we thank you for coming into the conversation that we're having and, and that it may continue to, to move forward. It, it would just, it would spring into action. And Lord, we just thank you. And, and Father, empower us as an organization, whether it's ERC or, or CGGC, you know, that we can come together, that we can make a difference in every aspect of our communities and um, in, in, in our uh, own backgrounds. And so, Lord, we just thank you that we can move forward together and, and show the love of Christ. Glory to God and give you all the glory, honor and praise. And we thank you. Bless us now. Move this conversation forward in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thanks for everyone joining us. Uh, again, join us tomorrow. And I think Nick has a new time chat today. Um, so you can join there as well. All right. You guys enjoy. <laughs>